You're listening to Beyond the Measure, episode 24. Listen as I, a young choir director, and my husband, a young composer, interview other music educators in order to gain insight into their own success in the classroom. We have a lot to learn, and we want you to learn with us. No matter your age, ensemble, or experience, this is the ideal podcast for music educators, composers, and students alike. So join us as we go Beyond the Measure. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond the Measure. I am your host, Christian, here with my beautiful co-host. Kara. Man, it feels like it's been a while. It really has. It truly has, yeah. It is the day recording this. It is January 11th, and our last interview was almost a month ago with Luke McMillan, and um, mm-hmm. it's, man, a lot's happened since then, just as far as, I mean, that was before Christmas, and... You're still in school. Yeah, you're well, still in school. I mean, school. I, I am back, but... Yeah, yeah, it was before the break and everything. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, how are you doing today, Kara? I'm tired. Tired? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the first week back from Christmas break. Oh, yeah. And we didn't really have any, like, work days to prepare us for coming back. So we literally just started on a Monday with the kids and everything. Um, and so it's been tiring, but I'm excited about this year. And... Um, I can tell the kids are just, I mean, it's going to wear off probably by next week, but right now, (laughs) um, (laughs) you know, they're excited and at least just like content with being back at school. Um, and so I'm just excited for this semester. I enjoyed spring semester so much last year and, um, I think I'm going to enjoy spring semester again this year famous last words (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) trying to be optimistic hey i was gonna say i mean kids being content in your class for even a day is a blessing so (laughs) having that especially right after the break that's a good good thing yeah and one of my class the the first okay so yesterday and tuesday um my non-varsity girls class is like i have a lot of tardies in that class and people just absent absent for um, or just not in my class for different reasons. And yesterday and Monday were like, I had so many kids in my class. I'm like, I, I don't think we've all been here together since maybe the first day of school. Hmm. And I even had some students be like, why are there so many people in here? <laughs> I'm like, that's because everybody's Whoa. here. <laughs> oh, that's how you know it's bad. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was nice. I mean... I could yeah. actually know how lo- how loud my ensemble could be if everybody yeah. was there. Yeah, so that's that's really exciting. So I'm I'm glad you're excited and and y'all are actually going to be doing one of my pieces mm-hmm. for for UIL Rising Storm. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I've got some exciting stuff planned as well. Um, I've mentioned it in a couple of previous episodes, but I'm going to be uh, at ACDA National ACDA at the end of February this year because. Uh, Frank Eichner and UTPB, they're going to be um, performing uh, part of my piece that they commissioned there. And so I decided to, I'm going to drive up and I'm going to have a booth there. And my name is already on the ACD app and everything. And I'm low key freaking out, but in a good way <laughs> for the most part. And so, uh, yeah, lots of good stuff going on. But overall, Christmas was good for us. I hope it was uh, a nice, uh, restful time for all of y'all uh, to take a breather. But as we said, we are back. Uh, And now we are continuing the episodes. Um, Before we get going, uh, uh, talking about our guest, um, if you haven't already, we would love for you to go into this year, get some, get this podcast to a lot more new listeners. So, and one of the best ways that you can actually do that is by one, sharing this with other people. So if you know of any people that you think would benefit from this podcast, please, by all means, share it with them. But also a good way to get uh, the, uh, the podcast algorithm, I guess you could say to help us is to leave us a rating, uh, and, or a review on uh, honestly, whichever platform you listen to, um, it doesn't really matter to us. Um, that's going to be beneficial. So, um, well, thank you in advance for that. Uh, we can get on with uh, what we're going to be uh, starting out the year with, with a very, very special guest. 
So we are starting off the year of 2023 by interviewing conductor Miguel Harbedoya, and he is the director of orchestral studies at Baylor University. Um, this is actually his first year there. He just took over um, from uh, Stephen Hyde, who had been there for many, many years. Uh, my dad actually played in the orchestra under Stephen Hyde back in the 90s, so he'd been there for a long time, did lots of great stuff for that program, and um, uh, Miguel is actually only the third uh, conductor of the Baylor Symphony since uh, it began, which is pretty incredible. Um, but he is also the former music director of the Norwegian Radio Orchestra, the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra in New Zealand, and the New York Youth Symphony. He graduated from the Curtis Institute of Music and the Juilliard School. He has also conducted worldwide, including the New York Philharmonic, the Chicago Symphony, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Munich Philharmonic, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, the Tokyo Metropolitan Symphony, Sydney Symphony, and many others. The list just goes on and on. Uh, and he's also the founder of the Conducting Institute. So uh, we got to uh, we got to have him on the show, and so we're very excited to share with you what he has to say. Uh, he tells us a little bit more about his experience um, at some of those ensembles and how what he's doing over at Baylor uh, now, as well as the Conducting Institute. Um, talked about a lot of good things, but he talks a lot about um, the importance of um, uh, your responsibility as a conductor to really study the score and to be one with the music because that is ultimately mm -hmm. what uh, what everything else everything else stems from your relationship not necessarily with the ensemble or with anybody else it's the music itself that's where it begins and so mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very important thing that some of us you believe it or not tend to forget as we get so caught up in worrying about all the other logistical and the things that, uh, that come with conducting and working with ensembles so Okay, so without further ado, here is our interview with Miguel Harpetoy. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today. Thank you for having me here. I, I think it's worth mentioning, um, if you haven't heard us, if anyone hasn't already heard us talk about this on the show before, but um, music as a whole is a very small community, but uh, the music community in Texas is especially small. And so uh, we were uh, able to get connected through Allison King, who we had on uh, a few episodes ago. She's the orchestra director at LD Bell High School, where you went to school, Kara. Mm -hmm. And so she got us connected. Uh, and so now here we are. So uh, we're really glad to have you. My pleasure. So um, just to start off, could you just let, uh, talk to us about um, how you came to be where you are today? You could be as broad or as specific as you want with that. So I'm originally from Lima, Peru, where I grew up through my high school days. And I grew up in a musical household, a single mom, one sister and grandmother. And the music the music that that I worked with I worked with was not the music that I do now. It was just popular Latin American music. So, but music is music. So it was life, you know, back then, and I'm talking about the seventies, the you know, there were no radio stations with classical music, much less recordings and much less the internet. So music was always a living entity. And I grew up playing the piano and then some violin, my sister, the guitar, and every member of the family did music one way or another. And of course, everybody sang and danced. So my interest to become a musician came from my job during my high school years as backstage crew for the theater in Lima. And this was, of course, after school hours. And the theater produced operas. So from hearing operas, mainly Italian operas, from behind the scenes, that moment turned my both my imagination and my dreams into becoming a conductor maybe because there were so many elements that i would that i wanted to work with such as you know singers an orchestra stage director there's a libretto there's a score there's a storyline all of that and i probably didn't have any one talent of those so i suppose learning to lead everybody was process of elimination the only choice i had and the biggest dilemma upon finishing high school was that we didn't have a school of music that trained conductors. So I already faced 
the challenge of if I want to pursue something, I have to leave the country and see where I can find a place of training. So that's how it all started. And then I left Peru for Chile, which is the closest country to Peru. And I was supposed to study music there at the university. Well, they had music studies, but not orchestral conducting as they thought they had told me or I thought I understood. So anyway, I'm in Chile and I'm already thinking where to go to. <laughs> so I'm like starting from scratch again. But the, one of the best things I that happened to me while in Chile, this is right after high school, is I met my wife. I met who is my wife now. So if that trip hadn't happened, you know, who knows what our lives would have been. So anyway, it was in Chile that I found the one school that I had the option to apply to. And it was the Curtis Institute of Music. So I set my goals on that school for various reasons, because it offered the conducting studies at the undergrad level, and it didn't require any paperwork, any like documentation that I had studied music, and it was an all scholarship school. I said, well, this is it, you know, it, this was it or it was nothing. So being accepted at Curtis was a turning point in my life because from then on, I started learning music as I do now. And if it hadn't been for my teacher, then Otto Werner Mueller, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. Probably I wouldn't be even a musician right now. And then that was the beginning of everything else. You know, from there, and I went to Julia for my master's. My first job was a twofold or a parallel job between being the assistant conductor of the New York Philharmonic and being the music director of the New York Youth Symphony at Carnegie Hall. And then other professional orchestras unfold from there, you know, Oregon, Auckland, New Zealand, Fort Worth Symphony, and Norwegian Radio Orchestra. And that covers basically 30 years, those, you know, four orchestras, until Baylor University, you know, approached me about a year ago, offering me what is called a target of opportunity appointment to succeed my colleague, Stephen Hyde, who had been there nearly four decades and to become the professor of conducting and director of orchestras there. So suddenly a major shift in my life happened, which I'm very, very happy for. And I always wanted to wait until past 50 years of age to be able to not teach officially because I don't think I teach in any particular way much less better than music educators, but my teaching really is my sharing of what I've done and passing that along with, you know, with a certain methodology. So that's the long answer to that. How did I get to where I am now? Yeah, that's great. And and I, I should have mentioned that my, my dad, so both of my parents went to Baylor and, um, uh, they didn't, neither of them majored in music, but my dad was in the orchestra uh, in the nineties. And so he was there with, uh, Stephen Hyde. And, wow. um, and so it's, it's, yeah, so it, it was pretty, um, I know he was there for a long time and, and correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you're only, I think I saw somewhere that you're only the third, yes. um, symphony conductor at Baylor, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, mm -hmm. that's correct. Wow. That's, that's incredible. And so I know you said you, you were, I, I know you said you were, um, like you said, you were wanting to wait till, you know, you were past the age of 50 to do something more like on, on the educational side in that way. Um, but what, what made you, what made you feel like a Baylor would be a good, a good fit for you and for, for where you're at? Well, I was teaching at the university of Nebraska, Omaha for two years beforehand. And that was the first institution that gave me a chance to, to bring you know, my teaching into an official institution. I've been teaching, you know, since the late nineties when my teacher asked me to be his teaching assistant. So I've been doing this here and there and taught at festivals like Aspen and Tanglewood and so on and so forth. But it's very different than carrying somebody through multi years of training. So, well, various things, our home has still been Fort Worth. We still have two high schoolers. And our oldest daughter goes to Baylor. She's a third year student there. But so she has been ahead of me at Baylor. And and coming back home and staying home, plus, I mean, the values of the university, plus the quality of the students, there was no brainer. I mean, there was there was no nothing to even think about or look at why not rather than the why. And they have been so welcoming of my programs, you know, I've created the conducting program as a studio, both at the undergrad level, 
you know, in addition to the existing grant studies. And I, yeah, I cannot tell you that I'm just blessed and happy. Um, I did want to ask too, um, in regards to, I mean, you, you've, I mean, and, and you kind of listed a lot of the places you, you went to and that you were conducting at throughout your career. I'm curious about how you got into those positions and like, I mean, for example, you were part of the New York Youth Symphony at Carnegie Hall. Like that's obviously a really, really big deal. And, and, um, you know, for those kind of opportunities that were presented to you were for all of those, did you just just look them up or, or find them and just decide to apply or, or did you have connections to people within those organizations that kind of helped lead you in those directions? Well, a little bit of everything because the, what I'm, the only network were people. In other words, there was nothing else. It was people talking about people, right? So I'm talking about the nineties. So people talked and they talked about, you know, who they saw, who they played under all the way back from my school days. So, I mean, I have classmates that are, you know, concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony, members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Boston Symphony. So they remember relationships, musical relationships from day one. So perhaps that's the one thing I want to stress to everybody. Music is about people making music with people they want to do. The, or they want to play with or be led by. There's no other way that music works. It's not just a trait of of a business arrangement. So, but there, there were some postings, you know, there was the newspaper, like newspaper existed, and you would check postings, you know, the listings of, for jobs, and, and all these institutions would post. There's a position available for assistant conductor, and these are the requirements to apply. There's a job for music director of the New York Youth Symphony, and these are the requirements to what to apply. So I did search those those you know jobs because once you're looking for a job, you kind of have to. And at that time, as I was finishing my master's studies at Juilliard, as a foreign student, I really had to go back to Peru, where we really don't, didn't have an industry to or place of work. So. It was a bit of, I have to look for something somewhere. And, but if you look and you, you know, insist, something is bound to come your way. But at the same time, music is a fit and much more so for a conductor. It's not a one way, it's a two way, you know, it's the conductor and the institution and the ensemble. You cannot, it's not a one size fits all. So there are places that are equally not interested in what I do. And that's totally fine. But there are also places that I'm not interested in going, which is totally fine. So it's a, it's a match. It's like, like a marriage, you know. It's just more than a friendly relationship. It has to be a marriage to, to connect the conductor with the ensemble, whether professionally, youth orchestra, community orchestra, or school. It's, it's the same principles. Yeah, that's that's great, especially for people that I think now, I mean, I, mean, I, I kind of feel this way sometimes, and I'm sure you know, students that are even younger than us, it, it's probably even easier to get into the mindset of when you're looking for a place um, to, you know, get a job at like some sort of position, kind of like what you're in. It's easy to just to just look for criteria and just view it as, oh, I'm just going to apply and hopefully get into a thing. But you bring up a great point about, you know, ultimately the foundation of the performances that you do and the kind of art you're able to create really comes down to the connections that the conductor and the director has with with the ensemble absolutely and i think all ensembles should never forget what a conductor is about you know a conductor is not about the conductor ever please remember that it's not about us and it should never be about the conductors it's about the music because without composers and their music we would have nothing to lead much less players would have anything to play so let's not forget that in the equation of music, the creator is the most important element. And then the musicians that recreate that music through instruments or voice. And then the conductors are really the last part of the equation. We only get you know, to coordinate and lead and, and put something together. So I'm sending this message, you know, please don't put us at the, in a pedal style as the priority of an ensemble. Yes, it's a component, but it's very much one part of the whole equation. 
So just a little bit ago, you were talking about like the relationship between the conductor um, and the ensemble. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what's like one of the first things that you want to focus on whenever you um, are <clears throat> in front of a new ensemble? To me, the goal of a conductor, particularly with the new ensemble, much more so, is the first encounter. That's what I call. In other words, the first rehearsal of any new music. That's it. The goal is not a performance. The goal is really that first encounter. So if we are able to connect, captivate, inspire, and lead in a very short period of time, and I'm talking about just a couple of minutes, five, ten minutes the most, it's very clear whether I'm able to be of use to an orchestra. And it's hard to describe what it takes physically, externally, but I know that what it takes internally is being one with the music. So if I'm not one with the music I'm conducting, like if I don't know it super well, like if it's not in my system, I won't be able to do what I just described. It needs to happen within the first few minutes of that encounter because we don't know each other. By the second rehearsal, we have known each other for one rehearsal and so on and so forth. So again, it's like any human relationship. What do you strive to when you meet somebody that you know you have to work together because you don't have an option. You don't have an option of, oh, I think I'll just go back home. So you have to realize that there's nothing really different than any other enterprise or partnership in this case. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. And and you bring up a good point. I The way you describe that, kind of going back to your um, your illustration about how the music is what ultimately brings everyone together. Um, it's it's easy for me. So like for me, I, I barely have any experience in conducting. Right. Um, and and so as someone that that is not super familiar with that kind of thing, it's really um, it's it's really easy for me, and especially as someone that just generally gets nervous just being in front of people, right, in general, um, it's easy for me to only focus on, oh, well, how do I, how do I just communicate to, to the ensemble and just how do I be in front of people, which, of course, is very important, but I think you bring up a great point in that ultimately it really needs to start not even with the people, but with the music itself, because how well you're able to communicate to the ensemble and connect to them is going to stem from your connection to the music first. Um, it's not like the other way around. Well, there's one great saying, which I believe is Benjamin Franklin's, who said, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And it's so true. I mean, much more so for conductors. You know, you, we, we do have to be on top of things all the time. So, but because of what we know and what we hear is invisible, nobody can tell how much conductor knows on, or is listening or is remembering of the work that needs to happen. But it really becomes very visible the moment things don't go right. And that's too late. So in all the training that I've had and all the training that I impart, is is about preparation so so kind of going off of that then i want to ask about what what does your process look like when you are preparing uh, a piece of music like before you've even met with with the ensemble right and you you open up the score for the first time or the first time in a long time what what is what are the first things that you look at to and, and then what does your process look like from there when it comes to score study the preparation of a conductor well, let me summarize. There are only three chapters in the life of a conductor, if I may. The first chapter are your skills that are reading and oral skills and instrumental skills and so on and so forth, skills. With those skills, then you go to chapter two and it's study score, study music. Because if you don't have the skills, you cannot study a particular score. And if you're missing a skill on a particular score, you go back to your chapter one until you have solved all of this. For instance, if you encounter a new instrument, if you have never worked with harp, Okay, then you better review or learn the pedals and the tuning and, and all of that. Then with once your score, your chapter two is solid and accomplished, then you can move to chapter three, which is the application of all of this knowledge from the podium. And I call this the conducting mechanics. I don't even call it the technique because it's not about 
us moving our hands. It's the mechanics. And we are mechanical individuals that have arms, faces, ears, you know, beyond means of expression. And when you have all of that, then you are ready to do a performance. But then the performance, I don't include it as the work of a conductor. That's the work of the orchestra. I always say that the conductor finishes working at the end of the dress rehearsal. And then we just show up to the concert. So now with that, with that you know, perspective, my chapter one has to be like super solid depending on the score that I'm about to study. Like the first time I encounter saxophones, which is a long time ago, but you know, I, I would get mixed up, you know, alt saxophone, tenor saxophone, baritone saxophone, I, I couldn't remember. So I go back and have to make sure that I don't get confused and I have my sounding pitches correctly because then my skills are, if I'm reading, I can hear what is sounding. An orchestral score is, is, is complex because there are so many transpositions that we have to you know, deal with and, and, and sounds of instruments that no score can tell you how they sound. You know, they can tell you the pitches, but if you, if you don't have the inner ear of every instrument in every section, then you have to learn that as well. So to your question, I do exactly that I do with a book. If I've read the book before, I kind of like, oh yeah, this is coming to mind. Or hopefully it's like, I have no idea that I've ever read this. Hopefully that's not the case. So, but most of my scores have annotations of some sort. So all these annotations and footnotes or sticky notes or highlighters allow me to refresh my memory of the things that I invested time on so that I don't have to start from scratch. So a lot of my work as a conductor is using my memory. Because if you think about every score may have only what, 10 measures at a time, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes less. So every time you flip one page, two pages, three pages, you kind of have to remember what you saw. And in the book is a little bit like that. Once you are 50 pages into the book, if you don't remember who was who and what they did or how they sounded or whatever the descriptions were, then you are not really reading well. So then it goes back to your skills. Are you reading well? Are you remembering well? So this can go for hours and hours and hours and sometimes for minutes because there are many scores that I, I know I know that within a few minutes, I can just bring back a 50 minute piece. So it's very unique that every piece lives in, in someone very differently. But I just read and when I read, I hear. And if I cannot hear something when I'm reading, then I have to go back to my skills and you know, am I hearing correctly? But it's an endless process. Also because the pieces don't change. If the composer is, has, is done with the work, the piece hasn't changed for a hundred years or more. I have changed 50 years now. So in other words, I am a different person looking at the same music. So therefore, it will appear that the music is changing, but the, the one who's changing is me. And that applies to every single person. When you read, read a book 20 years later, you are different. The book is still the same. But that's the beauty of art, that it's timeless and it's ageless. Or, uh, or scrolling back through your old Instagram posts from years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, don't look as, it doesn't always look as good as you thought it did. <laughs> Correct. Let us take a quick break real quick so I can tell you a little bit about this podcast's primary sponsor, which is Christian Fortner Music. That's right, my own music business. This is the primary platform that I use to sell my music, and you can uh, find it at www.christianfortner, that's F-O-R-T-N-E-R, music.com. Now, you may be thinking, oh, I don't know, this guy is a young composer. Does he really know what he's doing? Well, <laughs> to be honest, none of us composers really know what we're doing if, if we're being completely honest with ourselves. But if you want to kind of get an idea of what my music might be like and if it might be a good fit for your ensemble, you can actually uh, get a free copy of music from me. That's right, a free piece of music. This isn't just a study score. This is a full score and parts that you can use for your ensemble to perform completely for free. And you can do that by signing up for my mailing list. So if you go to my website, Christian Fortner, that's F-O-R-T-N-E-R, music.com slash mailings, you can sign up for my mailing list right there and you'll get a link in your inbox where you can select a piece of music for either choir, string orchestra, or a band. And I should also mention that the choir piece, it can be 
either an SAB, SA, or TB version. So uh, for any of you out there that are looking for SAB, SA, TB, specific voicings like that, then this might be a good opportunity for you. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. Again, if that's something you'd be interested in, just check it out on my website. And now we can get back to the episode. So what is, what are, so whenever you're working with, with, uh, student, like conducting students, people that are, that are, you know, wanting to, to get better at conducting or, or, um, people in that kind of situation, what are some really common kind of, um, I, I don't want to say mistakes, but, but like, do you, do you ever see people maybe focusing on one aspect of conducting too much when maybe you feel like there should be a, a bigger focus on, on a different aspect? Yes. By now, the answer is yes, yes, yes. I can tell you exactly what it is. But let me ask you a, a question to continue my, my answer. The conductor has two instruments, one on each side. What am I talking about? uh like your 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 two hands yes but no our ears we have one on the right side and one on the left side so the conductor's instrument is invisible that's our our instrument the arms only move along something else but if we don't hear the score when it's played by an ensemble in front of us that's the most common mistake meaning that somebody has spent them too much time listening to recordings instead of reading the score because no score sounds from the podium the way a score sounds through a recording. So I can tell very quickly that somebody's not listening to what's in front of them, but it's imagining a score that they must or they could have heard beforehand. And then the other one is blocking that sense of listening and watching by moving constantly. And when movement can also take take away your senses of timing of listening so those are the two things that i see the most and i keep saying w w without sounding you know the wrong way don't spend time in the youtube conservatory is what i say <laughs> you know it's a great resource youtube is fantastic it's amazing but it cannot replace you reading the score and more importantly hearing the score so th those two things are the ones that i do I do see most commonly because it's very exciting, you know, to see the tip of the iceberg of a conductor, which is what we look like. But the same at the same rate, I also say, picture that you are watching on TV or on YouTube, the process of a surgery, of a heart surgery. And the incision takes uh, just a few seconds. And it will be the same thing. I can do that. It takes 10 seconds. No, 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 no. It takes 20 years plus 10 seconds. Because if you don't know where and how and with what, what are you going to do? You're going to kill the patient. So it's a little bit like that. If you see a snapshot of a conductor waving arms for 10, 20 seconds and you say, I can do that. Well, how do you know? It may appear, you know, because it's an appearance. So in the other thing I tell, I tell students is if somebody tells you something that appears to be a compliment, such as, oh, you conduct like Claudio Abado, or you conduct like Simon Rattle, or you conduct like Gustavo Dudamel. Those are not compliments because you're basically a copy and chances are that you're not going to be a good copy. So I tell them all, you should conduct like yourself because then it's you, you and the music is not trying to imitate. If you think about it, you're imitating, that means you're a, your second, third you know, rate of an original, might as well aim to be original that's like the best i've ever heard it really described i think um it, it's like and also i i should say i can totally relate to everything you're saying as a composer too like it's a constant struggle just when it comes to writing music in the same way um it, it's so easy to look at somebody you admire and you look up to and want to be you want to be inspired by them and you want to be like them which is great but you can't let it become something where you're growing from the outside in it needs to come from the inside out. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to, as a composer, much less, oh, you sound like Mahler. Oh, that's terrible. Because only Mahler sounds like Mahler or John Williams sounds like John Williams. Yeah, exactly. Just, just you got to have authenticity. And <clears throat> it's, I, I feel like that's kind of a, 
you hear people say authenticity all the time, but I mean, it's, it sounds cliche, but it's, it's so important that it, it comes from the heart, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So you were, you were at, um, you were at Fort Worth Symphony before Baylor, correct? Yes. I finished my tenure in 2020, right before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. And then you're, you're also, um, you're also head of, uh, one of the, um, you have like kind of a, a conducting uh, kind of organization. Is that correct? What, what's the name of that? Oh, this is the Conducting Institute. Yes, gotcha. Can, can you tell us? Yes. So the Conducting Institute has been around since 2018, and it's a comprehensive place to focus on the fundamentals of conducting, where beginners can come and see whether you know this is something that they feel comfortable doing or early stage of conducting training and the the long program is in the summer it's usually three three weeks and it covers everything from your training symphonic literature keyboard skills oral skills instrument techniques obviously conducting the laboratory orchestra throughout the the, the, the weeks and in winter there's a shorter version that just happened last week. So it, it's the same concept, but we meet for a week of 10 orchestra sessions. We focus on one piece and we study the piece beforehand through an online score study. So that has been the system for right now. And it has been a great gateway for young musicians to either discover or have a first foot into the training of becoming an orchestral conductor. Cool, cool. So, so you, so you have the conducting institute, and then you were at, you were at Fort Worth um, uh, a couple years ago. Um, you finished your your tenure there, um, and so now moving moving to Baylor. Um, obviously, each of those are kind of slightly different types of settings. I'm just curious, like, what what are I mean, are there any major differences between those sorts of like conducting and working with um, different people in those different areas, or do you find like it's pretty similar types of, um, type of work across the board? No, they're completely different because at Baylor, I can plan to work with, you know, five students currently for a certain amount of years. So I see their weekly development and we have different goals. Now for the conducting Institute, I accept music educators, you know, youth orchestra conductors, community orchestra conductors, master students in conducting or undergrad students in anything. So there are several that have come multiple times over the years to the conducting institute because they may already be working, so they cannot really go back to school and, and devote their time to, you know, to orchestral conducting training. So it's a different outlet. But the principles of learning and teaching are the same as should be. You know, if you play the violin, playing in tune applies to wherever you are. Playing with rhythm applies whatever program you're in. Playing the right notes apply anywhere, all the time. So the principles are the same. The methodology and the pace is, is very different from one from another. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So for, for people that are wanting to, for maybe somebody that's wanting to, get more experience in conducting, whether it's, whether it's a, a student that's about to graduate with their bachelor's, or maybe it's a, a teacher that's, uh, that's been teaching for a while, but they finally want to possibly pursue their, their master's degree in conducting. If, if you could offer them like one piece of advice when it comes to, um, just kind of going into that sort of, um, training, um, what do you think that one thing would ultimately be that kind of propels them in the, in the right direction there? Right. Let's let me add to the list of of individuals that the high school students are equally welcome. And as a matter of fact, you know, I have two currently two undergrads and I graduated two undergrad in conducting that I knew since high school days, because it's a little bit my story. You know, if you know already that you want to do this from your high school days, you can plan accordingly. So but what I say is know what conducting is about. And it's not about what you see, what you think you see of a conductor. is what the conductor really knows 
and dust. That's what conducting is about. So it can be very frustrating because you don't see a tangible result. So my advice is always really understand what conducting is about, and then you love it because the curiosity that we need all the time is endless. The thirst for the knowledge of music, of new works, of new composers, that's part of being a conductor. You know, spending time listening to instruments that you have never spent time, that's to be a conductor. Discovering what you don't know, that's to be a conductor. More importantly, knowing what you don't know, that's being a conductor. So if all those things are there, then you can move your hands. But moving hands is only the outcome of, of all of this. So find these passions, these little passions accumulate and become one big passion that flourishes through our movements. The movements alone don't mean anything if you don't have all these sort of fires within you. It doesn't start with the, with the hands. It, yeah, that's great. It ends. Yeah. Um, and I'll even say like, um, as a middle school teacher, um, I can probably say I'm never waving my hand. I'm, I'm not waving my hands as much as I thought I was, I was going to be doing, um, whenever I was in college. So, (laughs) um, I'm dealing with other things. So, um, it's definitely not about just waving your hands around (laughs) on stage. I should mention to our listeners that while I was doing my undergrad at Curtis, I had to work. So I had a job as orchestra conductor of an all girl high school, San Maria Goretti in South Philadelphia. And classes started like at 7.30. Orchestra was at 7.30 to 8.30, something like that. Or, and then I would go back to school. So I, I know what it is to be in a setting in which the definition of a conductor is do whatever it takes for your ensemble to sound. So that's when I realized, oh, I need to learn how to help them with reads, both double reads, single reads. Oh, the valves of, you know, the tr- oh, something got stuck. Oh, the peg for the double bass and the end pin. That's what a conductor is. It's whatever it takes to make your ensemble excel. And more importantly, for your membership, like for your musicians, to love doing what they do. I mean, look at athletes. The training of athletes is gruesome. And do you think an an excellent athlete would give up training because, oh, it's too hard? On the contrary, this is what drives them, is knowing that they can be excellent and they will work even harder. So that's also part of being a musician. It comes with the territory that if I want to beat my record, let's compare to sports, like if I want to play better than my last concert, I have to work harder. It's not the other way around because I've done this for so long. Now it's easier. No, no. Even for me, you know, I've been conducting for 30, 33 years professionally. I still have to work harder to make sure that I can be better than myself for my last performance. And that's part of being a conductor and being a musician. It's not giving up. Um, I, w- I want to ask kind of going off of what, what you're saying about being familiar with, with all the different, like all the different instruments and all the different sections. So let's say there's someone that's kind of like in my shoes and, and Kara's shoes, like we're, we definitely both come more from a choral background. Um, and we, we have some experience in the instrumental world. Kara, you used to, uh, play flute in, um, uh, middle, middle <laughs> school. And, and I was, I played the viola. So we both have some background, but, um, you know, if like if one of us was wanting to try to get more experience in the orchestral side of conducting, what do you think is the best way for us to go about getting more familiar with those instruments and, and kind of going more in, in that direction? Well, you just hit the, the answer right there. An orchestra really is the combination of any instruments that the composer choose at any given moment or for any given piece. So... If you are working only with a piece for strings, then you better know the string technique inside out because the strings do not stop playing. So if you're not familiar with open strings, with chords, with harmonics, with certain choice of strings for certain passage, then invest on that one. Now, if your score has a few woodwinds only, like woodwinds and strings, so invest to make sure that you know the techniques of those instruments, like what are the range possibilities of dynamics 
what are the articulation possibilities, you know, based on uh, double read, single read versus, you know, no read, such as the flute. And if you keep adding, so in other words, your point of start is the piece of music. And if the piece is too complex, then put it aside and work in steps or by steps. So I remember the first time that I was sort of confronted with a piece with quarter tones. I had to like restudy this because I had never encountered this. Or when I did Ligeti's violin concerto in which the woodwind players have to double on ocarinas, which are tuned, you know, differently. So now I have, I mean, I'm talking about this is only a couple of years ago. So that means I have to restudy this. So it's that constant of the music that you're, working with and what you know about the components the, of, of the, the orchestra. So the same applies to choir and voices, you know. Sure, the voice is the voice. Yeah, but not. What about diction? What about, oh, this is a text in French. Well, it's not the same as a text in Italian. Oh, or this or that, or the vibrato of the voice or the support, holding, holding phrases. I mean, I would say seek guidance, that's what I still do. I have a great network of colleagues and mentors that there's no need to reinvent the wheel or much worse, create a wheel that is square. So it's not going to move. So to talk to people and seek guidance. Nobody knows everything. So as I said earlier, know what you don't know and seek guidance because it's very easy to just enter something in a, in a web search and I'm just going to look for the first three because they're there. No, you have to know actually where to find the answer. So if you don't know your resources, whether they're books, textbooks, historical notes, or individuals, I would say use that to the advantage. The fact that everything shows up now at our fingertips, which is not the way I studied. I really studied only in the library because that was it. It was the only place that you could find books and scores was in a physical library. And you sometimes you were not allowed to take those things out of the building. So then you realize that your guidance was much more selective, but then chances were that those were the right people that knew the right sources to continue then self-helping me. So it's a bit of... It's a complex, it's not an easy answer to your question, but it goes by what I don't know and then start from there. And if something is too hard, you choose something simpler. And there's no definition of hard and difficult because those are very, very relative terms to, for anybody because music cannot be defined as easy and difficult. Because there's just good music and the other music. Well, what I love about what you're what you're saying with with that and with some of the other stuff you've said already is I really like that you have a mindset of it doesn't matter how much experience you have, you're you can always learn more or you're you might need to review stuff you haven't done in a while. Like you always need to be constantly going back and reexamining yourself, you know, where do I need to to improve in? Um and then but then B, I also like that you really have the mindset of you, you really don't have excuses to not learn, uh, and especially nowadays. I mean, you bring up a great point. Um, I mean, now that we do have the internet and we have social media, is there's really no excuse to not being able to get connected to, to people that can be mentors to you and, and to give you advice and to help you along with those different things. Correct. Yeah one of the one of the one of the most helpful things that I've really stumbled upon as, as a composer, uh, cause I mean, obviously the same kind of things apply when I'm writing, I'm much more comfortable writing choral music than I am writing, you know, band music for instance. And so, um, there are lots of, um, people that I've connected with on online, on social media. And there are also lots of places like Facebook groups or discussion forums like Reddit where that are dedicated to, um, to you, posting questions and people that are experienced in those areas can even provide feedback for those kind of things. So um, there really are so many resources uh, available out there. Yeah. And again, building your network of colleagues is, it's a very good thing. And it's almost a natural thing. You know, you want to work with people that like you and vice versa. So again, let's, let's, in, let's put it this way. There's only so much time in life and time is the one thing you don't get back. So, Conducting takes a lot more time than people know because just reading a score, reading a page, 
reading a whole, I mean, not only one piece of music, we're normally involved with multiple pieces of music because we can be reviewing what we're conducting now, but at the same time, what I'll be conducting next week and what I'll be conducting next year and so on and so forth. So it's an, an, a constant turning wheel that never, never stops. So, and if the time or the use of time is not efficient, then that's the one thing that I always you know, look into. You cannot get it back. So either enjoy your time off, which is great to do nothing. Enjoy the time with your loved ones. Enjoy your time studying. But be aware that none of us know how much time we have left. And speaking of how much time we have left, we're, we're about at the hour mark. Um, I mean, I, I want to ask, I mean, is there is there anything else that, that you that, you know, just while you're here that you think you'd, you'd like to share with, with anybody listening? Well, I want to let everybody know that my door is open, whether at Baylor, whether at the Conducting Institute, or just simply as, you know, through Instagram. I have, you know, several people that just DM me through Instagram, and I'm happy, you know, to have a door there, you know, a virtual door for a- anything. Just as you wrote me, you know, I... I, I reply. I'm very diligent in keeping up correspondence. It's not easy. I admit to everybody that nobody has it easy. But I have a door. And, and the other thing that I will be launching soon is kind of the preview of my book. I'm writing a book that it'll be a couple of years down the line, and it, it'll be called About Conducting, Before, During, and After. But I'm going to launch it through a web platform, so that in the meantime, it can be self-help, it can be guiding. Of course, it can have videos and audio, unlike a book. So I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody know within the next the next couple of months, because there's no reason why to wait sharing this guidance that I'm talking about early on, because there's nothing worse than going the wrong way, because then you have to backtrack and start again. And again, that's a waste of time, you know, or asking too many people the same question, because picture that you are here in Texas and you want to go to, let's say, Italy. Okay, somebody is going to take you westwards. And somebody, if you ask the same question, how to get to Italy, well, let's go eastwards from Texas. Well, but if you ask both, at the same time, you're going to be zigzagging east, west, east, west, and you're going to take so much more time to get to Italy then by either choice, you know, go westward or go eastward. You're going to end up in Italy, just you cannot go in two different ways to the same place because that's not efficient. So I also say don't ask too many of the same question to too many people because you may have very good answers from everybody, but then you may not know how to apply those answers and, and get to where you want to go in an efficient way. I always say there's no rush. You cannot also accelerate time. You cannot make yourself, you cannot boil water quicker. Can you imagine? Can you yell at the pot boiling water? Boil quicker, quicker. No, there's nothing you can do. You just have to wait because there are some things that nature takes its own time. And music is very connected to to nature. And we should be aware of that, that we and music and nature are one thing. Man, yeah, you, you that's such a great point you bring up. And I feel like we should say that just while it's on my mind. I mean, uh, w- one of the purposes of this podcast is to have you know all those different varieties of of um you know experiences and advice uh, the the different routes to get to Italy if you will um and so if you're listening to this and you're hearing lots of different things that's very it's very good and healthy to have those different perspectives but um it can be detrimental if you're trying to do all of those different things at the exact same time so it, it is important to really figure out what do you think is going to work best for you what is the best uh route uh to Italy right and uh and and stick with it for for at least a time and and that's probably going to be best yeah absolutely highly recommend it and that way you can enjoy your time better doing the things you love to do which sometimes can be doing nothing or watching a movie or go for a walk which is equally important or sleep daily sleep is the best recommendation i tell everybody Oh yes, for sure. Well, cool. That that's so so exciting to hear about your book. I mean, um, I'll, I'll for sure have to check it out once once that is out. Um, but yeah, that's that's so great. Well, well, thank you so much for for coming on the the podcast with us. We really enjoyed mm-hmm. your time here. Um, just last thing before you go, um, 
so like you said, your, your, your door is open. Um, what is, what is the best way and, and how can people uh, reach out to you if they have any questions? Right. If it's Instagram, it's my name. There's no other Miguel Hart Bedoya in Instagram and you can DM me there. There's also my email at Baylor. So just look up Miguel Hart Bedoya Baylor and my email is there. So I don't have to dictate it here because it takes one easy step to do. You can also go to my website, miguelhardoya.com and find a way to write me there. And those are the most secure ways to find me. Honestly, I, I can be easily found and people do find me without any problem. Perfect. All right. Well, well, thank you so much for, for being on the show. We really appreciate it. And, um, uh, once, you know, one of these days, I'm, I'm sure we'd love to have you back on when you're available. This has been a, a great conversation. Any, any, any time, really. I'm, I'm very happy to, to spend the time with you, Christian and Kara. And I love what you do. Keep doing it. Thank you for doing what you do. And remember one thing, the future of music is not really so much in us performers, but it's in music lovers. And music educators have the future of music lovers in their hand on a daily basis. And we should not forget that. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's great, great, great. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Great. Until next time. Bye.